Scriptures show us that God shows himself in our world as a communion of persons. God shows himself as uh, not just the one God, but the one God who is one as Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, that's particularly disclosed and unfolded to us in the Gospel story, as we'll see, and particularly in the Gospel of John, which talks a lot more about the Father's relationship to the Son than the other Gospels do. But uh, that's not a completely new insight or a completely new revelation of God in the New Testament. Uh, there's preparation in the Old Testament that uh, leads into what the New Testament says about the Father and the Son uh, and the share, uh, uh, their shared spirit. Uh, and there are a variety of ways that we could uh, develop this point. I want to point to several passages to start with that uh, talk about the angel of Yahweh, uh, who is, at some points in the Old Testament, is identified with Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh seem to be the same. And yet there are other places where it's clear that the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh are being distinguished in some fashion. Um, there's uh, a, um, so we, we have that kind of complication. Who is the angel of Yahweh? Angel just means, in uh, Hebrew as in Greek, means messenger. Uh, it's a word that can be referred to um, the uh, to a human messenger, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, is my messenger. Malach is the word for angel or messenger. But when the Old Testament talks about the angel of Yahweh, it's a personage that transcends a human messenger. Uh, and again, in some passages, is identified with Yahweh himself. Uh, for example, in Genesis 22, this is the story of uh, Abram going to Mount Moriah in order to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Uh, and I'll pick up the story in verse 9. This is talking about uh, Abraham and Isaac. They came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for an ascension offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh will provide, as it is said to this day in the mountain, in the mount of Yahweh, it will be provided." Then the angel of the Lord called to uh, Yahweh, uh, the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand of the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Okay. So who is it that stops Abram from carrying out this command? Who intervenes and says, Don't do this? Well, that's not entirely clear. Verse 11 says, The angel of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh, this angelic personage that we find uh, throughout the Old Testament, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham responds. And then he said, verse 12, this is the angel responding to Abraham after he's called Abraham. Abraham says, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch your hand against the lad. You have not withheld your only son, your son, your only son, from me. So the, the, the last speaker is the angel of Yahweh. But he's speaking as if Abraham were going to offer Isaac to him, to the angel of Yahweh. Well, earlier on, it's the Lord himself who appears to Abraham. God tests him, Elohim, and tells him to take his only son and offer him up as an ascension offering on the mountain. Uh, implicitly, that's an offering to God, to Elohim. But here the angel of Yahweh is saying, you're, you've come to offer a, uh, Isaac to me. You're, not, you're willing to give him to me. You've not withheld your only son from me. Was well, the angel of Yahweh speaking, not somebody identified as Elohim or Yahweh himself. Uh, and then a little bit later uh, in verses 15 and 16, we have the same kind of complication. 
there are ways to sort out this one, I think, but it's still, it's still interesting that you have this complication of identification. Who is this personage speaking to Abraham? The angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time from heaven. It was still uh, angels, angel of Yahweh speaking and said, by myself I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. So it's the angel of Yahweh who's speaking, but within the speech, there's this uh, uh, idiomatic phrase, declares Yahweh. The angel of the Yahweh who's speaking speaks of himself as swearing by himself. That's language that elsewhere is used of Yahweh, swearing by himself. As Hebrew says, there's nothing uh, greater, so he swears by himself. You swear by something greater, but there's nothing greater than God. So when God swears, he takes an oath by himself. Uh, so it's the angel of Yahweh speaking of his own oath by himself, and he calls that a declaration of Yahweh. Now possibly you could say, verses 15 and 16, is the angel of Yahweh delivering a message from Yahweh, who is some other person. But uh, the seems a more natural reading is that it's the angel of Yahweh speaking of himself as the one who swears by himself, and the one who is going to bless Abraham. So again, we have the, quest, the broader question of the Abraham narrative. Who is it that gives commands to Abraham? Who is the one that promises to bless him? Who is the one that swears by himself that he will bless? Is it the angel of Yahweh or is it Yahweh? And it's really undecidable. The, the two personages seem to be identical. They're two different names for the same thing. Okay. Uh, like, uh, you know, you get uh, uh, Elizabeth and the Queen of England, two different names for the same person. They have the same referent. That seems to be the case in this passage. Uh, another place where you have this kind of complexity or con, uh, uh, this undecidable identity of a divine person is in the beginning of Exodus 3. This is Moses on Mount Sinai, uh, and he's shepherding his flock. Well, he's staying with his uh, father-in-law Jethro in Midian. <clears throat> uh, I'll begin at the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When Yahweh saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look at God. Okay. Who's in the bush? Same question. When we first begin the story in verse 2, it's the angel of Yahweh who appears in a burning bush. When he speaks, it's Elohim speaking from the burning bush. In verse 4, it's Yahweh who sees Moses turn aside to look and look at the bush and to examine it. Are we talking who are we talking about here? Are these three different, three distinct beings doing the same thing, or are these three different ways of talking about the divine person that's in the fire? Uh, and uh, you not only have that uh, confusion in the you know, who's doing what, you have different names for what appear to be the same person. But then you have, uh, he said, this is Elohim speaking. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Uh, that's, uh, and then it's Yahweh who says, I've seen the affliction of my people in Egypt in verse 7. So you have, you have two different beings talking here. Or are these different, different ways of describing the one God who is in the burning bush, the God who is uh, identified as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who's going to un unveil and unfold his name Yahweh to Moses later in this passage. Uh, all those and the angel of Yahweh are all different ways of referring to the same being. I think that does seem to be the most natural reading. And the names bring out different things. Elohim is a, uh, means gods, it's a plural, uh, powers. Yahweh is a personal name. Uh, that's not a title. It's translated as Lord in many uh, Old Testament translations, but it's a, it's, a, it's a personal name rather than a title. It's an unusual personal name, but it's a personal name. 
Uh, and then you have angel of Yahweh, which uh, is, again, this messenger. Uh, there's a several, this is, these are two of several passages in the Bible where you have this uh, apparent confusion or complexity in the identification of God. And the fact that you can use uh, angel of Yahweh and Yahweh, messenger of Yahweh, the one sent by Yahweh and Yahweh to describe the same being, the same God, is suggestive just by itself. So in those passages, we have this apparent identification. In other passages, it's clear that there is Yahweh and there is a distinct somebody called the angel of Yahweh. Uh, one of these passages in Exodus 23, this is in the midst of the Book of the Covenant where after uh, the Ten Commandments have been revealed on Mount Sinai, <clears throat> the Lord has spoken the Ten Commandments and written them on the tablets. And he's revealing these, what we call case laws, this, these instruction, this instruction to uh, Moses, to Israel through Moses. Uh, and uh, in verse 20, the Lord promises to uh, send uh, his angel before uh, Israel as they go through the wilderness and into the land. Uh, verse 20 of Exodus 23. Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on your guard and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression since my name is on him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, notice the uh, strange shift of pronoun there. If you obey his voice and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and adversary to your adversaries. My angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Mennonites, not, not the Mennonites, the Jebusites, and I will destroy them. Okay. Uh, so here we have an angel who's still being identified in some way with Yahweh because uh, obeying the voice of the angel is doing what the Lord says. But you also now have a distinction where Yahweh is speaking to, to Moses and saying, I, Yahweh, am going to send an angel, who he later identifies as my angel, before you, and he's going to bring you into the land and lead you into conquest. So here we have a sending Yahweh and a sent angel of Yahweh. Uh, you could force that into a strict monotheism and say, Yahweh is sending himself. And when Yahweh sends himself, he takes on uh, the title angel. Uh, that seems to be a forced construction. And instead, what we have here is Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh, which are distinct. One is a sender, one is, a being, one is being sent. But this is, this is uh, the Lord speaks this against the background of the passages that we've already read. Uh, the Exodus 3 passage where the angel of Yahweh Yahweh and Elohim all seem to be identified with each other. And now, in the same book, we seem to have these distinguished as the one sending and the one sent. How, how are both of those true? And again, obviously I'm suggesting that this is a hint of what will be later fully unveiled, more fully unveiled in the Gospel story, where you have a sending God, the Father, and a sent Son who comes into the world, and then they both uh, send the Spirit into the world. Another passage a great deal later in the Old Testament uh, shows us again a distinction made between the uh, angel and Yahweh himself. Uh, this is in Zechariah chapter 1. I'm assuming as I'm pointing these things out that the Old Testament is coherent and that it's not just trying to confuse us when it talks about these angel of Yahweh and Yahweh. I'm assuming that uh, it's, this uh, is not a result of sloppiness on the part of the human authors, but that these, uh, these, the unity and distinction of these uh, characters, these names, is pointing us to the reality of, uh, uh, of God, and it's pointing to plurality within God himself. Now this is, again, even more dramatically true, I think, in Zechariah 1. Zechariah 1 is the beginning of Zechariah's night visions, and the first vision, he sees uh, a, uh, a group of horses grazing in a, a grove of trees. Uh, and he's uh, uh, the uh, um, angel of the Lord uh, is among them as kind of the captain of this cavalry. 
and uh, they report back to the angel of Yahweh. This is in uh, the, the, the horses and their riders report back. It says, uh, verse 11, So they ant- answered the angel of Yahweh, who was standing among the myrtle trees, and said, We have patrolled the earth. Behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. This is consistent with other uh, uh, occasions when the angel of the Lord appears as the head of Israel's armies, uh, of the Lord's hosts, whether it's Israel itself. The angel of the Lord appears to Joshua before he goes into the land. He's the captain of the Lord's hosts. At other times, he's the captain, captain of an angelic host. He's still, But he's the head of the, uh, the armies of Yahweh. So now there, these, um, uh, the, uh, the riders on these horses are reporting back, everything's peaceful. Good news, right? Uh, no. Uh, verse 12, Then the angel of Yahweh answered and said, O Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, with which they have been, thou hast been indignant these 70 years. And Yahweh answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words, with comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said, Proclaim and say, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very angry with the uh, nations that are at ease. Okay. Uh, just to give the gist of what's going on there, the fact that the world is peaceful and quiet is a problem for Israel. Zechariah is prophesying shortly after the return from exile. Uh, and the, he's prophesying at a time when the project of rebuilding the temple has stalled. And he's a prophet who's encouraging the people to get back to work on the temple. Haggai and Zechariah are the two prophets who uh, provoke the people to go back to work and finish the job on the temple. Uh, they want things to change in the world. If everything stays the same, then the temple will never get built. The nations will not be brought back to, won't be gathered together into the house of Yahweh. Uh, It won't be a house of prayer for the nations as it's intended to be. So they want things to be shaken up. Um, And that's why you get this response when the report comes back, everything's peaceful and quiet, instead of that being good news, that's bad news. That's that's the, the substance of what's being said here. But notice verse 12. These, uh, these, uh, the, uh, these, other, these hosts have been doing reconnaissance. Uh, and they come back and report to the angel of Yahweh. And the angel of Yahweh answered and said, and, and he speaks to Yahweh of hosts, the angel of Yahweh, speaking to Yahweh, how long wilt thou have no compassion on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah? That how long is a typical beginning to a lament prayer, a lament psalm. We find it all over the Psalms where David is asking the Lord to intervene and uh, and, uh, rescue him. We find it in Revelation when the saints under the altar are uh, hoping for vindication, hoping for uh, vengeance taken for their blood. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you ignore the blood that we shed? Uh, Here we have the angel of Yahweh, who earlier in the Old Testament was identified with Yahweh, then also distinguished. But here we have a conversation going on between angel of Yahweh and Yahweh himself. We have a prayer of lament offered by the angel of Yahweh to Yahweh of hosts. Again, you might, uh, you might force that into a strict monotheistic framework and say, well, this is just Yahweh uh, play acting or speaking to himself. Uh, again, the more straightforward reading is that we have the angel of Yahweh, who's been earlier identified with Yahweh, who can speak to Yahweh, uh, he's, the head of the, he's the head of the hosts of the Lord, but he himself is uh, uh, a, uh, 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 reporting back, as it were, to Yahweh himself. Yeah. Uh, this is the kind of Old Testament, these are the kinds of Old Testament hints that I suspect uh, are, uh, were evident to uh, the New Testament writers. Uh, and they're behind. There's, they're at least overlap with uh, some of the things that Paul does when he's interpreting the Old Testament. And I want to look at a passage that I looked at with the uh, with the smaller group this morning uh, in Romans 15, just to give an example of how Paul is reading uh, a parts of the Old Testament and finding in them hints of what we uh, call Trinitarian relations between the persons. Paul doesn't use the phrase Trinitarian relations among the persons. Uh, But the way he reads the Psalms, the way he reads the Old Testament, indicates that he is seeing this interactivity 
within God himself. Um, and he's uh, reading, as it were, Christ, a conversation between Christ and his Father uh, in the pages of the Old Testament. Uh, so uh, Romans 15, Paul says, Now we who are strong ought to, ought to bear the weakness of those without strength, and not just to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor, neighbor for his good to his edification. So there's an exhortation to not, not to just seek our own good, but the good of our neighbors. He supports that in verse 3 by saying, even Christ did not please himself. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, a follower of the Christ, you need to live in a way uh, that's not just seeking your own pleasure and your own good, uh, but you need to uh, please uh, and edify your neighbor. That's what Jesus did. If you want to be like Jesus and follow him, you need to do the same. Well, how does he know that Christ did not please himself? He goes on, even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, he knows that Christ didn't please himself because of some text from the scriptures. Uh, he's, writing, he's writing the New Testament. He's not, cite, he's not citing the New Testament. He's not citing a gospel. Christ did not please himself, as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach thee fell upon me. That's a, that's a quotation from a psalm, Psalm 69, that Paul uses as proof that Jesus, the Christ, did not please himself. Those words, and just in, in the context that where Paul is using it, the words, the reproaches of those who, re, uh, the reproaches of those who reproached thee fell upon me, He's taking Jesus as the speaker of those words, which means that Jesus is the first person, me, at the end of that sentence. This is an example of Christ not pleasing himself. He's willing to take on reproaches that are directed to someone else. He's willing to take those on himself. They fell upon me. But you go back to that psalm, and it, you know, it's not Jesus speaking. He's not in the title. Psalm 69 is a psalm of David. It doesn't say a psalm of Jesus. It says a psalm of David. And it's an occasion when David is calling out to the Lord for rescue. And he's uh, talking about uh, pleading with the Lord, uh, talking about his afflictions and sufferings. But Paul is reading that psalm of David as a psalm, seeing those words of the psalm of David as the words of Christ that prove that Christ did not seek his own good only, but sought the good of others. So what is, how, do, how does that work? What is, he, what, is he, what is Paul implying by that? Uh, I'll begin in uh, Psalm 69, verse 5, where, where David writes, O God, it is thou who dost know my folly, and my wrongs are not hidden from me. May those who wait for thee not be ashamed through me, O Lord God of hosts. May those who seek thee not be dishonored through me, O God of Israel, because for thy sake I have borne reproach, dishonor has covered my face, I have become estranged from my brothers, I am an alien to my mother's sons. And then verse 9, For zeal for thy house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach thee have fallen on me. When I wept in my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate talk about me, and I am the, I am the song of drunkards. The drunks make up songs about me, because I'm such a pathetic, uh, I'm, my suffering is, makes me so pathetic that the drunks are making fun of me. Uh, verse 9, the first line of verse 9 is a, uh, a line that uh, is quoted in the New Testament in John's Gospel, the zeal for thy house has consumed me. John quotes that at the beginning of his Gospel when he talks about... Uh, the uh, Jesus action in the temple. That's a, that's a uh, manifestation of the zeal that Jesus has for the house of his father. And John takes it as a statement, of, even though it's a, in a psalm about David, where David is the, um, for, uh, the first person, the me, who's consumed. John takes that as a statement about Jesus. He's the one who's, who's fully, full, who's full of the zeal full of zeal for his father's house. And then verse 9, the second line, is the part that Paul quotes, the reproaches of those who reproach thee have fallen upon me. Again, Paul is taking that as a, another statement made by Jesus. Who is he addressing? 
Well, in the first line, a zeal for thy house has consumed me. He's dressing God, the one who is, whose house the temple is. Uh, the one whose house the temple is, the one who's being reproached. And uh, David is saying, in the original context, the reproaches that are directed to God are also falling on me because I'm God's representative on earth. The way Paul interprets it is saying that the reproaches directed at the Father, Jesus himself is taking on himself. His zeal is such, his love for his Father is such, his passion to serve his Father is such, that he's willing even to receive the reproaches that are directed at his Father as reproaches against himself. Uh, this, if you look at the whole Psalm 69, you'll see that there are a number of fairly clear references to the crucifixion suffering of Jesus. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, it fits into that context. Jesus goes to the cross uh, out of zeal for his Father's honor. He loves his Father so deeply that he's willing to take the reproaches that they, the Jews direct against the Father on himself and suffer for them on the cross. So, uh, the, again, that, uh, that's consistent with what I've been saying about the angel of the Lord and Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh and Yahweh are sometimes identified, but then we see them at times in conversation with each other in Zechariah 1. Here, Paul is reading back in the psalm, and he's seeing David's words, uh, ultimately fores foreshadowing, perhaps, the words of Christ, who is speaking to his father and declaring his zeal for his father, and his willingness to suffer uh, for, on his father's behalf, suffer the reproaches that are directed against his father. So uh, in Paul's reading of the Old Testament, I think that's a, that's a uh, as I mentioned this morning, that's a, that's a kind of offhand quotation. It's not like Paul is doing Trinitarian theology. It's not like he's doing a dissertation on a Trinitarian reading of the Psalms. He's giving an exhortation to the Romans that they shouldn't just seek their own good and their own pleasure. And in the context of that, he kind of does this toss-off quotation that shows that he's reading the psalm, psalm that psalm at least, as the psalm, uh, uh, as words spoken by Jesus, and a declaration, Jesus' declaration to his father of his love for his father. Um, so Paul's reading the Old Testament as revealing these kind of internal uh, relations uh, between God and uh, his son, the Christ. Uh, that are already foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And I think that's uh, one of the reasons why Paul can do things like he does uh, right, quite remarkably at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 8. First Corinthians 8 is the beginning of Paul's uh, discussion of meat, sacrifice, to idols, big issue in Corinth, big issue in the early church. He's going to go on to, not only to talk about meat sacrifice to idols, but he's going to go on to talk about the Lord's Supper in that context. But I'm interested in the, a few verses at the beginning of chapter 8. He says in verse 6, Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. There is no God but one. And he's going to go on to use that uh, uh, as uh, part of an argument for saying that uh, if you come across meat that's been sacrificed to an idol, if it's available in the marketplace, buy it and eat it. Don't ask, don't have qualms of conscience about it. It's from God, because he's the only God there is. But then he qualifies this, even if there are many so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, for us um, apostles, for us Christians, maybe for us Jewish Christians, for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. Uh, that is a, a restatement of the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, where Israel is taught, taught to say, The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Paul is saying there are many, many people worship many gods in the world. There are many gods and many lords. There are many powers in the world. But for us, there is one God, the Father. He's the creator of the world, and we exist for him. This is kind of the, the confession of monotheism for the Jews. But then, Paul goes on, 
Uh, for us, there is one God, the Father, and we have a, an and in that sentence. How can you say there is, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, there is one God for you, oh, and also another Lord. What sense does that make? But that's what Paul does. One Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Okay. Uh, as N.T. Wright points out when he discusses this passage, uh, Paul has put Jesus into the Shema. He's right there next to the Father, the one God, Yahweh. He's part of the confession of the one God. We confess one God by confessing one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. That's how Paul confesses one God. Um, so uh, there's not only that uh, that uh, twofold Lord. There's a God. There's God the Father, and there's the Lord Jesus. But it's interesting to uh, meditate on the different ways that Paul describes their relationship to the world. The Father is the source of all things, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him. Perhaps that's a that's a a, a goal or telos. He's the Alpha and the Omega of all things. We exist for him. Jesus is also related to all things that exist, but instead of being the origin, he's not from him, but it's by him. Consistent with what we find in Genesis 1, as interpreted by John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And this is the Word by which the Father spoke the world into existence. It's from the Father by means of his eternal Word. And Jesus is not the one for whom we exist, but the one through whom we exist. It's through his uh, continuing power, his continuing providential power, that we exist. He's not the telos, but he's the means by which we reach the telos. So we were reading a wonderful passage in Augustine uh, at lunch today. Uh, the God who is the truth and the life has made himself the way. If you're on the way, following Jesus, you have the truth and the life, which is the destination. Destination and way come together in one because Jesus is the way to the Father. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, here, uh, uh, Paul is uh, saying that uh, the Father is the destination, the one for whom we live. It's through Jesus, the way, that we come to the Father. But Jesus being the revelation of the Father, uh, being on the way and being at the destination kind of overlap. Uh, that's still working. Uh, Paul's not interpreting or quoting from the Old Testament, but he's modifying the Old Testament in the light of what Jesus has done, in the light of what's been revealed in the gospel. And he says that, that now we have a God who has revealed himself, a God who has shown himself to be a communion of persons. In the Old Testament, the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh, in Paul's understanding of uh, Psalm 69, uh, God has revealed himself to be the Christ who speaks to his Father, who acts out of love for his Father. And that's the, those are the germs from the Old Testament. Those are the, the seeds in the Old Testament that, get, uh, that begin to flourish, sprout and flourish and grow when we get to the Gospel story, and particularly in John's Gospel, as I said. The relationship between the Father and the Son is ex extrapolated and explicated in John's Gospel far more than it is elsewhere. Uh, when God comes to show himself, he shows himself in Jesus, but there are occasions in which Jesus and his Father are together, or Jesus is talking about his Father, uh, where Jesus talks about his mutual relationship with his Father. The inner life of God, which was obscurely and uh, obscurely shown in the Old Testament in little hints and shadows, is now opened up to us. God shows his inner life to us. What do we learn from John's Gospel? We learn that the Father loves and delights in his Son. As he says uh, in all the Gospel accounts of the baptism and of uh, the transfiguration, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We learn that the Father gives to the Son. There's a, a gift exchange that goes on between the Father and the Son. Uh, John 3, uh, 35 The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. 
So we know that this is a relationship of love between the Father and the Son, and there is a uh, that love is uh, expressed in uh, the Father's giving all things into his hands. Um, in John 5, Jesus says, uh, I have been given to have life in myself. The Father has given me authority to judge. The, God, the Father has given me power to raise the dead, power to grant eternal life. Does he have that eternally? Yes. Is it given? Yes. There's an eternal giving of the Father from the Father to the Son as an expression of love. John 17, as Jesus goes to the cross, now is the hour. Now is the hour when the Son will be glorified by the Father and when the Father will be glorified by the Son. Now your glory, which we had from the beginning, now the glory that we've eternally had is going to be shown. And the glory that we've eternally had is a glory that is shared and bestowed one upon the other. The Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father, and we see that unfolded to us in the strangest of places in the cross. As Jesus goes to the cross, he's not talking about, in John's Gospel at least, he's not talking about the anguish that he's going to suffer. He's talking about the glory that's going to be displayed. As the Son goes to the cross to glorify his Father, and the Father lifts up the Son on the cross to glorify the Son. And that mutual glorification is not just something that is evident uh, on earth. It's not a matter of the relationship between the Father and his human Son. This is an unfolding and revel this is a revelation of God's inner life. How the Father and the Son have eternally lived in fellowship with one another. Where's the Spirit in that? Uh, John has a lot of father-son activity going on, but where's the spirit? I think the spirit is, as Augustine says, the spirit is the gift. Uh, when Jesus says that the Father has given all things into my hand, that's as much as to say, the Father has bestowed his spirit on me. When he says he's given me the power to have life in myself, that means that the, the Father has poured out the spirit on me. That's, it's by the spirit that the Son lives and has life in himself the Spirit that proceeds from the Father and is given in return gift uh, back to the Father. When Jesus says that I have authority to raise the dead and Father, the Father has granted me that authority, uh, that is a, another uh, reference, I think, to the gift of the Spirit. Uh, the, uh, the, the overall point that I'm trying to make that I, I, I trust is clear is that God, in showing himself, he shows himself as a communion of persons, in a fellowship of love, mutual gift, and mutual glorification. He shows himself as a communion of persons who are so uh, zealous for one another that the Son is willing to go to the cross and suffer the reproach of his Father uh, that, uh, so that they fought, those reproaches fall on him. He's so, so zealous uh, for his Father's house that he's consumed in that zeal. Uh, that's the kind that that's who God is. Uh, that's the God that's revealed in the scriptures. That's the God that's revealed in um, the gospel. That's the way He shows Himself because that the, that's the way He eternally is.